Um, this will be lock picking your SQL Server uh, with Shane Welgama. Uh, Shane is a DBA with Compass Education, and I will let Shane take it away. Thanks, Brody. Thanks for that, mate. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Shane. Uh, let me quickly share my screen so you guys can see uh, the slides I got going on the demos. Radio, let me quickly present that. And hopefully you all can see the title slide. Yep, yeah, it's coming up. Awesome, awesome. And uh, if I switch to my demos, you guys obviously see that coming up too, right? So if you guys see this uh, SMS, yeah? Yes, I see awesome. a four screen kind of deal thing. Like yeah. a two screen, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, 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 awesome, awesome, awesome. And is it, and the font size, is it okay? Like, um, uh, the font size at the bottom is very nice on the lower right. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's going to be the same size. On the those left are side. still pretty good. Yeah, okay. I, I think okay. it's very readable. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Perfect, perfect. Rightio. Um, let me go ahead and share the screen again. Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, my name is uh, my name is Shane Wilgama. The full version is just Shane, but my mates call me Shane. I am... Uh, based down here in uh, Melbourne, Australia, um, and yeah, it's about it's about 4:30 in the morning here, so uh, nice and early. And uh, good morning and good afternoon and good uh, evening to any uh, to uh, you know, wherever everyone is based at. Um, and yeah, today we're going to talk about in this session we're going to go through lock picking your SQL engine. It's uh, it's yeah, we'll just get into it and I'll show you the agenda and everything. Um, uh, just we'll start a little bit about me, I guess. Um, Brody did mention I'm a database administrator at Comps Education. Uh, it's funny because I think uh, just a week ago I actually got I just switched to a new job as a data engineer at I2I Logic, so it's just a last minute job change. Uh, but yeah, I actually was a DBA for Compass Education. We makes we make software for schools mainly, and I was doing that for about two years, and then recently just became a data engineer for a small fintech startup, and. Um, uh, but the job is data engineer, but really I'm doing a lot more DBA tasks and a little bit of uh, Python development with ETL pipelines. But uh, my main skill set is with uh, data, database administration and data management, in, specifically in SQL Server. Uh, uh, before I went into the tech industry, I was actually a iRobot salesman. Uh, iRobot is that, you know, the, the Roombas. So I used to be a salesman for those guys. Um, this was when I was back at study and university, so it was what I did to pay the bills back then. And then after I graduated, I got a junior DBA position at uh, at Compass. So um, that's how I. It's a standard progression in a uh, IT career. Uh, I'm joking, but yeah, I used to be a robot salesman, and I'm fairly new to the speaking. Um, fairly new to speaking. This is my eighth presentation. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to feedback. Um, and I'm also a Microsoft Certified Solutions Associate in uh, database development. But yeah, that's a little bit about me. Uh, in this topic, in this talk, what we'll be going through is obviously uh, the overall concept is locking in the, the SQL engine. Um, so that goes to SQL Server, obviously, and then Azure SQL. Anything of any Microsoft product that uses SQL engine as a core component will you will likely see uh, the locking being similar, if not the same. Um, we'll be going through a general idea of lock-in, asset compliancy, uh, granularities, modes, the compatibi compatibility and escalation. Escalation is actually one of my favorite topics because it's, uh, it's you, you don't find it in every single RDBMS. Uh, for example, Postgres doesn't have it. So Postgres doesn't have uh, lock escalation, but SQL Server does. Um, controlling that lock escalation, and then we'll go through obviously deadlocks and how to analyze them, how to maybe monitor them over a period of time, and then obviously how to fix them. And then we'll also be talking about application considerations when uh, when creating an application to prevent deadlocks from happening. Or just, or just generally prevent locking issues from happening. Um, so yeah, so let's start off with the general idea of locking and ASIC compliancy. Uh, just want to start off by saying that uh, you will normally especially if you're a DBA, you'll normally come across or you hear from, if you're a developer, you'll hear from the DBA saying that, you know, some locking issues going on, locking performance issues coming up. 
lock-in is not necessarily a bad thing. It is not a bad thing at all. Actually, it's a it's an essential thing. You need lock-in in a SQL Server environment. Any relational model uh, database management system, you need lock-in to uh, uphold data integrity. So it's not a bad thing. It's actually an essential thing. Um, but obviously, long periods lock locking on the on a particular resource. That's when issues come up. That's when performance issues come up. Um, also, feel free to ask questions as I go along. I'm happy to answer them as I go along, Brody. Or if I see them in the chat, I'll answer them straight away as best as I can. Sure, no problem. Awesome, thanks, mate. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah. So locking is an essential uh, part of the relational model of a database management system. Um, they're great for you know multiple user environments. Uh, but something I really want us to remember while going through these uh, slides and this presentation, I want us to remember that. A single a lock is essentially an in-memory data structure, uh, and they're just 96 bytes in size. So that's and that kind of will make more sense why I want us to remember that when we talk about lock, lock escalation and those kind of topics. But basically, it's a it's an object that takes uh, that takes up memory, right? It's a small amount of memory, but still memory. And uh, like I said, it's it's designed to uphold data integrity, data integrity. And we'll talk about asset compliancy. Um, in asset compliancy, uh, in, in, when you talk about asset pop properties, isolation is what really uh, is the more relevant thing when it comes to locking. But I'll go through them all a bit quickly. So, atomicity is uh, all or nothing. So basically, if you had a transaction, begin, tran, uh, commit, or roll back at the end, and in the middle you had like a couple of DML statements, data, data modification language. Uh, insert, update, or delete. If you had a couple of them, let's say you had three of them. If the first two ones succeed and the third one fails, everything gets rolled back. So either they all succeed or they, none of them gets uh, committed. You can think of that as optimicity. Uh, consistency is like, um, take for example, a you have a table that has a clustered index, and then you have other, let's say, several non clustered indexes that are referenced in that table. All, all the Indexes and table have to, their reference in data has to be consistent. So that's an idea of consistency. Isolation, basically every single person that's using that, uh, using SQL Server, uh, can imagine themselves be, will feel like they're interacting with the data on their own. Uh, so they won't see any halfway through modifications by another user. So that's isolation going to keep that thing, keep them separate from seeing those kind of changes. And then durability is like uh, when the server, I don't know, like someone pulls a plug at the data center, yeah, the SQL server is able to gracefully, you're able to get the, um, recover it back to a uh, relatively good uh, point in time. And the log, the transaction log file, transaction log really helps with that. Uh, but isolation is what we're going to really focus on here. So uh, just general idea of locking. This is going to be quite basic. I apologize if it's. Uh, I just want to. I want to just gradually build up. Uh, we have two user here. Two users here, Jan and Jason. They both have access in database. They're just reading data from there. Simply as simple as that. And uh, to read data, it's it's uh, fine. Both they both can at the concurrently do that at the same time. Even if it's if it's a specific resource, they both can read the specific. They both can read the specific resource at the same time. Um, now let's say Jan wants to write the database, and then Jason wants to read. Let's say Jan is updating a specific rule in a table, right? And then Jason wants to read that specific rule. While Jan is updating that rule, Jason will be blocked out from reading that rule. And this is this is a um, normal locking behavior, because Jan has that rule currently having an exclusive has having a writing. More updating that rule, uh, Jason won't be able to read it until Jan is finished updating that rule. So that's the general idea of it, right? Now we'll go into a bit more deeper into this uh, into locking. We'll start at the with, at the granularities. So on the right over here, I hope you guys can see my mouse while I move around. Um, so this little picture I got over here with a hierarchy. At the start, you have a database, then you go table, then you go page, then you go row. When we talk about locking, generally speaking, we always say like the row is locked. 
or the tables locked. And that is that is true, but there's also there are the levels that are locked with that uh, that they have locks applied to them with that other object that we mentioned, the row or table. This is what we refer to as the locking hierarchy. Um, now, the lowest you can go in that hierarchy, the most granular you can go in that hierarchy, is RID or a key, right? RID is basically a, a row in a heap, and a key is a row in a cluster index or in an index. So that's the lowest you can possibly go in the hierarchy. And then higher up in the higher hierarchy, you can go to, so the next up is a page, as I'm sure most of you are aware, you know, a one, dot, one uh, page is equivalent to eight kilobytes of data. Um, and then we go to extent, which is like eight pages of data, uh, then a heap, uh, then tables, uh, you can do locks on, you know, the file level as well. Application, metadata, metadata is like system data. Allocation unit is a, uh, to my understanding, what allocation unit is, is like a familiar set of pages. So the, the difference between that and an extent, an extent is eight pages. Allocation unit can be, uh, it, it's not defined by the number eight. It can be several, se several familiar pages. That's my understanding of it. And then database, obviously, that's the highest of the hierarchy. So database is um, uh, generally shared locks. You will have the, on that when you are uh, running your queries. And I'll explain why that even happens on a database level. But yeah, so that's locking granular, granularities. Uh, just, yeah, awesome. Um, right, so locking modes. Um, <clears throat> Now, locking modes is what you are applying onto um, that granularity we just spoke about. So, at, on the level of the hierarchy, what are we actually? What kind of lock are we applying onto that? What type of lock you could think of it as? Uh, this, it's a bit wordy. These slides. I do apologize for that, but I will. Uh, I'll, you, you can have a read of it if you like, but I'll give you in my own words. A shared lock is basically um, when a when a query it, it's typically generated from reads. So a read will apply a shared lock onto a uh, specific resource. In this case, on the bottom over here, you can see this uh, little diagram here. Let's say I ran a uh, select query to get me a sp one specific row. That will do a shared lock on the database level. Then we'll do what it's called intent locks onto the lower level um, database objects till it gets to um, where it intends to apply that shared lock. Shared locks are compatible. So like I said, like two users can read data, uh, two, two users concurrently can read the same piece of data, same piece of, same resource. So um, an intent lock, you can think of it as, I have the intent of applying a specific lock on a lower level of the hierarchy. So table has intent shared lock. So IS, that's what it's uh, shown by. Then the page has the intent shared lock. So that what that means is, okay, I want to go D, I want to go even further down the hierarchy. Actually, we want to go to the row level. And then I come to the row level and I put the sh actual shared lock on it. Now you might be wondering why do we have these intent locks? Why they're necessary? The reason why we have them is because we don't want anyone else to um, change the table or the page that is related to that row while we are actually running a query to observe that row. Even though we're reading it, we don't want this table or page to be altered in any way. We don't want like, a column to be dropped. If the column is dropped, you know, that's going to cause issues for reading that specific row. So um, these intent locks help keep the data integrity across the hierarchy. So they'll actually block out other users from trying to change um, the table or the page. Um, that's why they exist. And also, you might be wondering why is there a shared lock on the database? Uh, same same line of thinking. Uh, so basically, we don't want someone to uh, go ahead and drop the database while uh, another user has an open session on it, right? I mean, that that's the general idea of why these locking hierarchy, why uh, these hierarchies exist. Um, so yeah, so shared lock is uh, a lock that can be applied to uh, that 
you know, just allows anyone to read the same piece of uh, resource. Update lock, you can think of it as where if it's applied on a resource, basically what it's saying is SQL Server is saying, okay, this session wants to modify this record, wants to update it, but I, don't, I can't apply an exclusive lock just yet because another user is using it. So I'm going to put an update lock, kind of like booking a table, saying, right, after this, after the other user is finished with that resource and after it releases their lock, uh, my update lock is going to convert into an exclusive lock and take that resource for the session that's waiting to update that role. So you can think of it that way. It's like a reserve in a table until it can convert into an exclusive lock. Um, and then intent locks, like I've mentioned before, are locks that are saying that, right, I have an intent to uh, apply another type of lock lower down in hierarchy. Uh, in this case, these are IS locks. Now, let me go through a couple of demos just to discuss what we just went through here. So just to better understand what's going on. So you can see I got two screens, or two, uh, I split the windows up in SMS. Now, um, we'll look at the window on the left side over here. There's a, this stuff pretty much you can ignore. I really just want you to pay attention to the query over here, but I'll explain what, I'm, what I've done over here. Oh, by the way, all the scripts are, uh, it's in a GitHub repository. I will link it into the chat uh, for this uh, talk. And so uh, you guys can go ahead and use it. I'm using TSQL v5, which is a sample database by Itzik, Itzik Benga. He's a, he's a legend in the, SQL, uh, in the SQL server industry. I'm sure you may have come across some of his work. I recommend his books if you get a chance to uh, read them. Um, so, yeah, so I'm using, uh, that's what I'm using as my uh, database to run my queries against. Um, basically, over here, I am declaring, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make sure that whatever queries I run from this session is, is, easy, is easily identified. So I'm, I'm just calling this session A, right? So, every, so when we look at the queries, you can, hear, you can see here an example. Session A is doing this, right? So that's why this line over here exists. Uh, that's why these two lines exist, actually. Uh, set transaction level to re repeatable read. I'm doing that because I want us to actually uh, observe the locks when I run my diagnostic queries. And then I set lock, ti lock timeout to minus one. That's actually the default. What that means is the lock will just be applied indefinitely till I roll back or commit the uh, uh, query. Um, the reason why I specified that is because I'm, I'm always paranoid about demonstrate about online demos, so I just want everything to just work as intended. So I just put that there just in case. Um, yeah. So, anyway, so I'm gonna start off with this query over here. I'm not gonna run the rollback. I'm just gonna do the begin tron and then the select from sales order, where order ID equals 10,384. Right. Very straightforward query. Then on the right hand side over here. I have my diagnostic query. It's using DM translocks, couple that with uh, sessions to uh, find out information regarding what's going on with my locking right now. So you can see I got four locks right now. And remember, each lock is 96 bytes. Remember that I, I we talked about in the first slide. So we got, just want to remind you guys. So um, yeah, so this is session A. This is what session A is doing. It has a database shared lock that is granted. Then after the database level, we go to the table level, which is object in this case, uh, the object level, which is table in this case, uh, and has a intent shared lock granted. Then we go lower object, and uh, then we go to page, sorry, which is intent shared lock again, because we are aiming for that row, which we have applied the shared lock on, because it's, a, it's select, it's reading, so we've got shared locks going on here. and that's why these two, the higher level hierarchy ones, have intent shared on them. Um, so I hope that makes sense so far. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Now, that's a simple select. I'm just going to roll that back. And let me double check something. Okay. Now, what, what about getting that involved with another uh, select statement? So let's run that again. And then let's run this select statement over here. With the, without the rollback. And you can see they're both gone just fine. So you can read, we can read the, 
they can they're all granted right there's no granted means that the the lock has been applied right now let's go ahead and what we'll do instead is we'll comment this out and comment the right so i got to update over here let me just roll this back well and i will first apply I'll first apply the select we'll do a read first and then we'll do the update um Actually, no, we'll do the update first, get the exclusive lock on, and then we'll go with the read. Right, now you can see the read is currently executing query. It's not going to complete. It's just going to keep going. And the reason why is because if we go to our diagnostic query over here, we can see that session A, session B, session A is the this side over here that did the select that's currently still running. It's got a database shared lock, which is expected. Then we go lower to object, which is the table, intent shared. Then we go lower to the page, which is intent shared. And then we go to the, uh, the row, which is a shared lock, and it's current request that is wait. That's because it's not, it's waiting for that resource to be free. Because currently session B, so session B, has a exclusive lock on that row, and that's granted because that ran first. So session A has to wait till session B is finished. So if I go back to that session, and if I, this is session B, if when I execute the rollback, you'll notice that the results here will immediately come back. So I'll just control E, and there you go. Uh, this, that's because the session, the, the lock was released from the, from the exclusive lock has been released, and then the read was able to actually access the data. So let me now roll that back as well. Awesome. And anything comes up now? No, just shared locks now because the sessions are open. That's why the shared locks are still there. So you can't drop those databases while the sessions are open. Um, right. So, and then something else I also wanted to show you guys. Um, this is something I love using. Let me just run that. I just ran the right. Sorry. Oh, apologies, guys. I think I was muted somehow. Apologies for that. Um, uh, okay. I, yeah. So I think I was talking about the uh, SP. Do you guys? I hope you guys heard this part. I'll say it again. Um, okay. SP underscore who is active. This is a great, great stop procedure by Adam Mechanic. Um, he's uh, he has done a great doc piece of documentation as well on his website. I do highly encourage anyone who works in SQL Server to use it. It's really useful into diagnosing, does not diagnosing performance issues. For example, here you can see that I got two queries running, and one is session ID 80, which is this one over here, and session ID 69, which is this bad boy over here. And what you'll notice, I can get the query text. Um, I can see what is blocking which query. So this the second the second session is blocked by 80. So Basically, there's a lot of information here. Yeah, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because you can check that out in your own time. I am also on the clock. <laughs> um, so, yeah, highly encourage you guys to check it out. SP Who is Active, really useful tool, open source tool. Uh, now, let me go ahead and ooh, let me go ahead and roll this back and roll that bad boy back. Beautiful. Radio. Now, if I go back to my slides. Yes, no questions. Good, good, good. Radio. Uh, there's also other locking modes as well, or locking types. Uh, so we went through uh, shared intent locks and um, exclusive locks. Those are the basics. If you got those down, you you can. The others are just ice on the cake, but we'll go through them. <laughs> Um, here we got intent. So intent locks, there's a, var a large variety of them. 
uh, intent exclusive, intent shared lock, intent update lock. Uh, basically, they're all in the same concept where they want they have intention to apply that type of lock on a lower level uh, on a lower level hierarchy object. Um, so you can see on the right hand side over here, I got intent exclusive locks or intent update lock. What that's saying is basically, okay, I'm at I'm I'm going to apply an intent exclusive on the table level. That's because I want to apply the exclusive lock on either the page or the row level. But then we get to the page, it says intent exclusive, intent exclusive which means we're going for a row for exclusive lock. Again, that's just there to uphold data integrity. That's the main purpose of it. Um, so, and then if we go to the next slide, which is conversion locks, these are a bit more, I would say, rarer, but you do come across them. Um, the basic idea which had in, with intent locks uh, is that it's saying all the all the objects that are below this level hierarchy. So let's say if I got a let's say I got a shared with intent exclusive SIX lock on the table. What, I'm, what SQL Server is saying is that it's going to apply, it's going to read all the resource, all the pages that belong to that page, that, that table. So um, it's going to apply an intent, ex, it's going to apply intent exclusive on all the pages in the lower level hierarchy. Um, whereas and it, just a normal intent exclusive is just saying I'm going to apply it on either a couple of the resources or maybe one resource, not all of them. But in this case, SIX means we can do all the pages. Um, and then same kind of concept with the shared with intent update and update with intent exclusive. It's saying that all the resources are going to have a um, either going to have a mix of uh, have uh, going to have a uh, lock applied on them, not just specific few. All of them are going to have a, a lock applied on them. And then before I move on, also this table here, I want to just quickly go through it. So like I said, shared lock is read operations. Update is from um, if you're going to apply exclusive lock onto it. So it's resources to, to be updated. And then exclusive lock is the demarcation. Intent lock is to establish lock hierarchy. Uh, schema locks, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so I mean, not really. <laughs> what I mean is a schema lock is, um, apologies, is um, as, as you can imagine, it's to uh, make sure that Whatever operations running, so like let's say index rebuild or index, uh, yeah, index rebuild, they will apply a schema, uh, schema S lock, which stands for schema state, state, stability lock, and that means that don't change the schema structure, don't change the column types, uh, data types in the columns or anything like that, while the index rebuild is happening. So that's what a schema uh, independent operation lock is. Uh, funny enough, the no lock that a lot of uh, devs and people tend to use sometimes applies a schema uh, sta stability lock. So no lock, the table hint, don't think of it as it doesn't apply any kind of lock. It actually does apply a, a type of lock and that's a schema stability lock. Um, and that obviously goes for the same as read uncommitted isolation level. But I'm going a bit off topic now, but uh, feel free to ask about that if you guys are interested. Um, Bulk update is just in yeah, bulk inserts. That's the kind of lock that's been applied from those. And then key ranges is the uh, range of rows. Um, locking compatibility. This is also an interesting little topic. Um, basically, it's how uh, different locking modes uh, interact with one another. Interact with one another. So, if uh, if you look at this table here, I've requested mode based. You can think of it as incoming lock. So, what lock is coming in to grab that resource. And then grounded mode is what lock is currently on that resource currently holding it. So you can see from this table that exclusive locks, they don't play nice with anyone. They don't like sharing their resource with any other type of lock, even themselves. So they're the most uh, strictest type of lock you can think of. And that makes sense, right? Because when you're modifying data, you don't want other users to be changing that or seeing your changes midway, right? So you want you want those exclusive locks to be applied on. Um, and then intent shared or intent locks tend to be um, the most forgiving ones, where they're most they they play nicely with most other types of locks. Um, uh, so yeah, you can 
you can see from this table, there's all kinds of combinations you can do. This is the very basic table. This is the one that if you kind of, if you obviously if you understand this, you can kind of get through most of the situations. The version that they have on Microsoft documentation is this bad boy right here. It's a bit blurry. Apologies for the screenshot, but uh, as you can tell, it gets quite complex. It gets a lot of different situations going on. A lot of different types of locking modes that have been covered, like a shared range shared or a share insert range null. There's a whole type of uh, different variants of locking modes, uh, but you know, just cover the basics. And if you go to one that in the in production that you haven't seen before, just Google it. You'll find the right answer on documentation, on like Microsoft documentation. And just a side note: that's why I love Microsoft products because of the documentation by Microsoft. It's so, it's honestly some of the best uh, documentation out there, in my opinion. Um, okay, lock lock escalation. One of my most favorite topics. Um, right, so now locking is, as I said earlier, is one lock is 96 bytes of data in memory. So, and I showed you a very small query that's looking for one row, and that one row ends up having four locks. Now, if you have many queries, if you have like queries that are doing, let's say, a larger selection of rows, a larger section of tables, joins, all these kinds of things. You start to see the locks start to stack up, right? Because there'll be several pages. Each page will have a lock. And then those intent locks are also 96 bytes. When you go deeper, when you go to the rows, each row lock will be 96 bytes. Talk about million rows, talking about pages, talk about tables, the database, that's gonna be one database. You're not gonna have, I mean, maybe you might, but generally speaking, that's gonna be one. But you can see how all this adds up, right? And just to further that point, I have this diagram over here. Think of this first diagram on the top as a, um, let's say, as an update, an update in a row. And let's say lock escalation did not exist when this query was fired, okay? So what will happen is, at the start, there'll be a shared lock on the database, which is 96 bytes, right? That's standard. So no one drops the database. Okay, cool. Then we go to the table, and we're gonna apply intent exclusive. Intent exclusive lock is going to be 96 bytes because, like I said, we're going to update a row, right? So we're going to go deeper down the uh, table, but for data integrity purposes, we're going to put an intent exclusive lock there. That'll also be 96 bytes. So now we got both these locks. Each is 96 bytes. Then we're going to we're going to get a couple of pages. We're going to update a couple of rows, so we're going to get a couple of pages, and then all together, all those pages all together are 180 kilobytes. So this is this is separate uh, data, separate amount of memory for each level of hierarchy. Then we go lower to the actual rows in those pages. There's many rows, and the rows just alone is about 2.88 me uh, megabytes for the locks, right? So now, if you add all this up, that's what that's how much memory this one query is going to be taking up, just for the locks, right? Not for the actual data, just the locks. So. Now you can start to see how this starts to add up, right? Because if if you have millions of records, if you have millions, if you have a couple of tables, these things can these locks can really add up in memory, and you can start having memory issues. What Microsoft did to uh, resolve this is they created this concept of lock escalation. Well, actually, I shouldn't say I don't know if they created it, but they impl they implemented the concept of lock escalation. Um, and what that does is if SQL Server believes that a query is quite memory intensive in terms of lock-in, if the lock-in is quite memory, it's lock-in. I think you're muted again. Hello? Uh, can you guys hear me? Hello? Caroline says you can hear me. Uh, I'm not hearing you. You're not hearing me? Um, Oh, sorry, it's just me. <laughs> it's all good, mate. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, awesome. Um, all right, so yeah, so um, Microsoft created this lock escalation concept um, to combat this memory pressure that you would face in these kind of situations where there'd be a lot of locks. And the way that works is, it's um, what it would do is if it'll come to a certain threshold. Where, where the memory comes to a certain threshold, SQL Server will just simply 
escalate all those role level locks and all those page level locks to a table level, straight to a table level. It's not like row to a page. It's like row and pages all up to a table level. And then instead of having all these uh, memory fault, singular locks on rows, you have just one lock on the table, which is 96 bytes. So in terms of memory, it's a huge savings. Now I know some of you are thinking, right, Shane, that sounds great for memory, but uh, I've got an exclusive lock on my table now. The whole table is locked out for this one query. All my other sessions are going to be blocked out. And you are correct. That, that, that does happen. Um, and that's why I think of lock escalation as a double-edged sword. But that, keep in mind that exclusive lock on a table only happens, it, it hopefully only happens for a couple of milliseconds, right? We want our queries running fast. So if you're able to run the query, if the query is performing really well, this, that's not going to be an issue for you because even it's actually, it's going to be a benefit because you're using this memory. Yeah, there'll be an exclusive lock on the table. Hopefully it runs quickly and releases a lock as soon as possible. But now if the query doesn't finish quickly, that's when you start to have real big issues. And you'll notice this uh, happening if you ever ran a massive like delete or an update uh, onto a production table, which I know production table has has happened in in my in my time in me in my uh, past jobs. I've seen where um, a dev has ran a massive DML statement and locked out the entire table till the statement has to be completed. Um, so if you have situations like that, yeah, it's it, lock escalation is an issue, but obviously you've got to, you've got to avoid those kind of situations. But basically, this is what lock, lock escalation is. Um, now, how do you control it? Okay, now this part I don't recommend doing, but I'll go over it. By default, you can you actually can set the t uh, a, a specific table on how they should uh, operate with lock escalation. The default is table. What that means is that when a query wants to escalate the locks, they'll go from they'll go straight to the table level. If, however, you have if, if the table is partitioned, what you could do is you can actually set it to auto. And what an auto does is it will set it to it will escalate the locks, the row, the pages and the rows, just to that specific partition, not to the whole table. And that might sound pretty good if you have your tables partitioned in the first place. Um, but there is an issue with that. There's actually a big issue with that. I'll go through that just in a second. The third option is disable. Basically just saying, I don't want log escalation to happen. Um, just, I don't, I have got plenty of memory. Just do uh, one row at a time. Just, just get, not one row at a time, one room at a time. Just apply as many locks as you want. And um, that you will, I guess and you you can experience high concurrency with that because you know you're not going to hit a table lock anytime, but uh, I just hope you have enough RAM to support that because that's going to be quite taxing. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, if you if you log, if you read blogs also on lock escalation by a lot of famous blog writers in SQL Server, they also don't recommend playing around with this. It's it's very it's, it's very specific use case. Uh, be very careful. So I would say I've never touched it, personally speaking. Uh, now, why auto is a bad idea, uh, why it can be a bad idea, is because, uh, like I said, there's, so there'd be partitions involved, right? So let's look at transaction one over here on the bottom diagram. And so actually, transaction one is uh, firing a, let's say, an update onto a specific row or a couple of rows in partition one of, this, of a table. So it's got exclusive lock by transaction one, right? Okay, cool. Transaction two has also got a um, statement running to apply a another update to partition two of that same table, right? So this is the same table we're talking about, but two different partitions. And they're able to go like this because they're different partitions. And then let's say we lock partition two by transaction two. Now in that same transaction, let's say transaction one, let's say there's a second part so that the way I want to think of it is as, let's say, begin tran, update, and then let's say a uh, a, sele a read, a select, and then a commit, okay? So the second part, the read, is trying to read partition two. Now, that second part is going to be blocked because partition two has been exclusively locked by transaction, transaction two. Now, let's say transaction two has the same kind of layout, 
and wants to read for the second part, partition one. And again, it's going to be blocked out. It's going to create a deadlock, right? This is what a deadlock is. And this is what happens when you have the lock escalation set to auto. So you might uh, start to see in your application where you will get uh, deadlock errors, victims. So one of these transactions will be a victim and that'll be terminated. I'll explain more on deadlocks in a short while, but that's general idea of what will happen. Demo four. Right, now let me quickly show you guys my next demo. This guy over here. Put that over there. Let's close up the earlier windows. Just make sure things roll back. And like I said earlier, all these uh, all these uh, scripts will be in a GitHub repo. Will be in a GitHub rep repo, and you guys can uh, feel free to use them and check them out. Um, right. So and don't need that as well, actually. Yeah, perfect. Radio. So um, change that to 91. And comment that out. Okay. Now I'm going to show you guys lock escalation in in real time. So let's go ahead and um, I just quickly. This is a now diagnostic query that I'm using again. Just DM trans locks works like a treat to diagnose locking issues. Uh, over here on the right hand side, I got. I'm sure some of you who, who have used this little trick before, just using cross joints to as a row generator. So I'm just basically what I'm doing is I'm just saying instead of 100 records into the order order items table, right? I'm not going to do a rollback, just a big and tron, and fire. Right there we go, and fire this. Now you can see there is okay, you, you might not be able to see that, but it says over here 103 rows, uh, and what you'll notice is there is a shared lock on the database, a shared lock on uh, a, no, internet exclusive on the object, and internet exclusive on the page. This is an insert, so that's why it's going to create uh, ex exclusive locks because it's trying to modify data, or, or in this case, insert data. Uh, so, and then uh, there's going to be a hundred row locks on a hundred key locks, hundred exclusive key locks um, it, that are happening right now as well. And that's because we're incident 100 records, right? So that kind of makes sense, right? That's why it says 103 rows in total. That's why we got all these rows right over here. Right now, let's up the ante. Instead of doing 100, let's do 1,000, right? So let's do 1,000 rows. And now let me see what's going on. Right now, there's 232 rows. Um, what SQL Server did was it said, "Look, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to be doing a." Thousand uh, key locks. Instead, I'm going to uh, put. I'm going to take some pages because I can. Uh, this is not considered lock escalation. I know it sounds like it, like you're escalating the keys to a page, but that's not lock escalation. Lock escalation is strictly to the table level. This is more like SQL Server saying, right, this page. There's there's a lot of rules in this page that need that are going to be locked anyways. I'm just going to lock the page instead, right? And then, um, so an allocation unit here. As I said, allocation unit is a Familiar set of pages, so that could be a several amount of pages in this uh, one lock right over here. And then, yeah, so we got all these key locks. Tab the object is still intent exclusive, right? So there's no table lock yet. So that's good. Now let's bump it up again to 10,000, right? Let's go that far. Let's see what happens. Interesting. Only seven locks now. So instead of doing a large amount of number of locks and taking up that memory, SQL Server said, right, none of that. I'm not going to do all those key locks. I'm going to bump everything up and I'm going to bump it. I'm going to lock. I'm going to do a lock escalation to the object level. And you can see the request mode for object is now exclusive lock. So now we have a table lock going on. So that's lock escalation in real time. Um, and this is so the reason the whole purpose of this is so to save on Memory resources. Does someone have a question? Oh, sorry. Okay, I thought I heard something. Um, so, yeah. So that's the. And some of you might be wondering, like, right? So, saying, what's the trigger for a lock escalation? Like, is there a trigger for this? Um, yeah. So, from what I've read, and it does say in documentation, it does. They do give a hard number. They say, um, 
when a single transaction tries to apply 5,000 locks, lock escalation will uh, trigger and go to table level. Um, and also there's another trigger as well. So that's one trigger. Another trigger is um, something to do with memory threshold. That one's a bit vague. There is no real hard documentation on that. I've read on a few blogs, so I, I can't really tell you if that's for certain. But depending on the mem how much memory is uh, left over by SQL Server, it will also uh, escalate if need be. So like uh, if there's high memory pressure, SQL Server will, to a certain threshold, SQL Server will uh, escalate it to a table level to save on uh, memory. But 5,000 locks by a single transaction will typically uh, cause SQL Server to escalate that transaction. And keep in mind that a single transaction, so begin tran, and if you have a lot of DML in that one transaction, and that all does 5,000 locks, then lock escalation is going to happen. Not multiple transactions for the same resource. It doesn't work for that. It's a single transaction for 5,000 locks. Right, so that's that. I already rolled that back. And yeah, awesome. And yeah, awesome. Right, let's go back to uh, the demo. Deadlocks. Just give me two seconds, guys. Deadlocks. Right, so um, I'll quickly talk about deadlocks before I go into the analysis. But like I said, explained it earlier. Uh, if you have two transactions, uh, transac each transaction has two uh, statements within it, two DML statements, let's say, and they're overlapping in their resources that they want. And the overlapping, when the overlapping does happen, um, if there is no way for the transaction to proceed, SQL Server, what will do, what it'll do is, it will pick one of them as the victim, it will terminate that uh, transaction, and allow the other one to uh, proceed and finish. If you're wondering how does SQL Server pick the victim, uh, it's basically the one that's easy to roll back. SQL Server believes that, right, according to my statistics and information on this query um, and the cost of it, it seems to be easy to roll back. I'm going to roll this one back. So which one's easy to roll back? SQL Server will do that. Um, and what tools now do we use to, uh, let's say you're getting a lot of deadlock uh, errors in your application. How do you go ahead to diagnose that? and how do you find the root cause, what are the, what are the transactions, and yeah, just how do you solve this? Uh, tools I like to use are XM Events and SQL Server Management Studio. You might be wondering why did I specify SMS? I specified that specific tool is because if you're using Azure Data Studio, you can't, you can't uh, it doesn't give the exact same, it, it's not as enriched as uh, SMS when it comes to uh, deadlock uh, functionality. A deadlock diagnosis. Um, I'll show you what I mean in, in a bit. Uh, so, yeah, next demo right now. Demos five and six and seven. Again, all of this will oh, actually don't do that. All of this will be in the GitHub repo for you guys to check out. We'll start with five. Who was that? No need that. Put that onto this side. Are you doing that? Okay. And what's 5A? That's 5B. Good. Right, I'll put that on the side as well. Sorry if it's confusing, but I'm trying to move all these things around. All right, basically, you can see here I got uh, two transactions. Transaction left is uh, session A. On the right is session B. Okay. So, I'm just here. I'm just trying to show you a deadlock in action. So let's go ahead and run the left side first. Begin Tron. First update. So I ran only the first half of this transaction. Then run the second half of this transaction. Keep in mind that there is uh, something else I should talk about. Uh, this trend, this A is trying to update sales order on order ID 10,384, and then it's going to update customers uh, where our company name is NA and uh, sorry, where customer ID is 49 and set the company name to NA. And then in transaction two, it's going to do this part over here first, and then transaction one, what it began with, is going to be second here. Right? Cool. So now let me just go and run the next part of this transaction. 
you can see it's currently just running because session B is trying to grab um, sales orders and sales orders currently has a lock on it. So it can't actually do it. So it's going to continue having this indefinitely. Uh, if I run this transaction here, where it's going to grab uh, customers and customers is currently used by transaction uh, B, let's see what happens. So session A was picked as the deadlock victim. So you can see a transaction was deadlocked on, lo on lock resources with another process and has been chosen as deadlock victim. Rerun the transaction and transaction B has completed successfully. So let me roll that back. Let me roll that back. So that's a deadlock in, oh yeah, nothing, not, nothing to roll back on that side. Uh, that's a deadlock in uh, action. Now, let me go ahead and showcase. Hold on. B, six, eight. Yeah, that's good. Let me just go ahead and showcase how we how we can go about to um, actually observe what's going on, and um, you know, go ahead and maybe maybe get a track record of what's happening in our SQL servers in terms of deadlocks. So. Extended events is a great tool to use to actually go ahead and um, monitor uh, what's going on with uh, in a SQL Service. Diagnose, di to monitor. Uh, it's, a, it's a very lightweight tool, lightweight monitoring tool that's built into SQL Server. Um, this code over here creates a what is called an uh, extended event session called deadlocks. Sorry, my voice is just, I'm losing it. Apologies. Um, called deadlocks. So, uh, yeah. So I'm going to go right over here and run this session, run this code, create the deadlock, uh, create the session that's going to that's going to monitor deadlocks. Now, if I open up another new SMS window, if I refresh, so if I go management and then go extend events, refresh this bad boy, and you should see deadlocks is now created there. If I go watch live data, right now it's empty, so I just, I just created it. Uh, but this is a great way to actually keep like a historic record of um, your SQL Server performance. You can start and stop extended events at any time you like. If you know a specific time in your environment that's causing a lot of deadlock issues, a lot of locking issues, you can run this extended event to uh, monitor that uh, the time frame and see what's going on. So if I go ahead and quickly cause a deadlock to happen, like I did before. So if I just run that, run this, run this, and then run that. Give it a second. There you go. Uh, deadlock just occurred. So if I go back to my SMS, you'll see now that there's actually a report. Uh, here we got a, um, if you go to the deadlock tab, you will see the deadlock graph come up. This is a really cool thing. So basically you can actually see exactly at that point in time, so it gives, it gives a timestamp of everything, what, what, what was involved with the deadlock. You can see, if you hover over this sign over here, you can see what query it was. It says update sales customers. Um, you can see what kind of modes of lock-in that were applied, what resources they were aiming for. You can see here index name is PK underscore customers and the on bottom PK underscore orders. It'll give you the object name as well, so the specific table. So this is a great way to find out what actually exactly happened. And also if you guys are a fan of the XML, I believe you can also open up the XML report like this and then you can actually copy the specific queries that were fired to cause a deadlock as well. So, um, yeah, it's super useful. And uh, these are saved actually as, uh, you can save them as files. Where did I create my one again? Let me just double check something, guys. Um, you can create them as files and in the, into your, and keep, keep a historic uh, record of uh, the performance on a weekly basis, maybe, or, and see the, if the deadlock's actually decreasing or if it's the same culprit every week or daily. Um, 
So it's a really great way to actually like uh, capture what's happening in SQL Server at the time and then archive it. Because as you know, most things that happen in SQL Server, especially in the plan cache, get flushed out after a while. So if you want to keep a track record of it, this is the best way to go about it. Um, and then finish up with the last. Oh, actually, hold on. Before I go into the demo, I want to go back to slides real quick and talk about application considerations. Uh, basically, these are things I want. I want uh, not just I want, but generally people should be looking into when uh, designing an application and to just prevent and you know not to to prevent deadlocks from happening. Um, for example, uh, it's 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 really it's, it's things you can just have a chat about. Really, like let's say you are you are kind of dealing with deadlocks, um, and you know which queries are failing. You can uh, have a chat with the business and uh, understand which one is more high priority. And what you could do is you could uh, you could use something called deadlock priority, which is a uh, keyword. And what it'll do is it will actually you can specify if a deadlock would happen between uh, this query and another query, which one should it, which one should be, uh, which one should be the victim, and which one should be allowed to uh, proceed. Um, the deadlock, so this will actually uh, bypass what SQL Server believes is easier to roll back. Like I said earlier, SQL Server picked the victim that's easier to roll back. Deadlock priority will bypass that. Uh, another great, great tip that I tell people is um, keep your transaction short as possible. So if you have a big intron and a commit or a rollback, and in the middle of those middle of those statements, you have a ton of DML or a ton of just statements in general, you're gonna you're gonna notice deadlocks can happen more are more prone to happen in that scenario. So keep your transactions shorter, and maybe split them up. You don't have you can break it apart. You don't have to have it all in one transaction. Maybe you can have it in separate transactions if you could. Um, I also you can try to brute force it where like you can code it in a way where if the log does happen, just try the transaction again, the one that failed. Um, so yeah, that's the, some very quick things you can do to uh, handle or to avoid deadlocks. Uh, deadlock priority. Well, before we say thanks for listening, I want to quickly show this last last demo. Um, number seven, which is this guy over here. Sweet. So you can see in this demo, I'm going to be running again. It's the same same two uh, same two uh, updates on either side. I've got a bit of a delay this time, just to is easier for me to run this. I'll put that to five seconds, ten seconds. Um, I've used set deadlock priority high here and low on this side. This will instruct SQL Server to understand which one should be the victim. So run this, and if I run this. We should expect um, the left side to be the victim. Or oh, nothing happens. Hold on. Why is that? That's why it's happening. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, the early demo is transaction still running, and it was blocking both them. <laughs> so, so sorry about that. Um, yeah. So that. So now I rolled that button back, and now those two, these two were able to uh, actually fight. Actually, have, create a deadlock. Um, right. So as expected, set deadlock priority for on the when I set the deadlock priority to low on this side of transaction. SQL Server picked this guy over here to be the victim. Let me roll this back now properly. Good, and roll this back as well. If I change these to high and low, the one on the right-hand side now should be uh, the victim and not the left-hand side. So using these tricks, you can actually then uh, plan which one should be the victim. So you can see here, right-hand side was the victim. Uh, and if high and low is not as granular as you want to use, you can also even use uh, now integers between minus n and 10. So you can even go, um, you can have more finer control over the deadlock priority. Um, 
but yeah, that is my lock pick in your SQL Server session. Uh, just quickly, if you guys are interested in further learning, I highly recommend a there's a full site course called uh, Managing SQL Server Database Con Concurrency by a gentleman named Gerald Britton. I have no affiliation with him at all. I just think the course is quite good, especially for if you're someone, maybe if you're a junior DBA and trying to learn locking a bit easy, a bit you know smoothly transition locking, understand the concepts. It's a great little course. There's many great uh, blogs. This is one great blog I like quite a lot by SQL Check. Um, also, really any book by Itzek Bengar in terms of T-SQL, there's always going to be a chapter about concurrency. It's always going to touch lock-in. It's always going to be a gem. I highly recommend it to Itzek Bengar's books. I get no money for saying that. I'm, I just really do mean his books are exceptional. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, my blog, I it's a bit dry at the moment, to be honest with you, <laughs> but if you want, you can follow it. Um, I've, I'll be working more on it uh, uh, soon enough. And like I said, all my presenta all the demos and scripts are on uh, this uh, um, on my GitHub repo, yeah, which is Shane Gama, that's the uh, name, and then presentations, and all the demos and the slides and everything are there. Uh, so yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Any questions? Shane, thank you very, very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, please, by all means, drop them in the chat. And while that is happening, yep. <laughs> um, I'm also going to drop uh, in the chat the link for the feedback. Um, feedback oh. really helps all of our presenters. Uh, yes. And um, it, it just helps us all get better. Um, if you have not uh, entered into the raffle, um, please do so. I was just posted the uh, and, GitHub oh, yes. link as well. Thank you. Want it. And, yeah, all good. I really have to set up my GitHub. I never get around to it. <laughs> I did this report like about two hours before the before before right now. So I just remembered that I was like, oh shoot, we're gonna do that. <laughs> I just uh, remembered. Yeah. Sorry, does, Go ahead. Does Gautam have a a question? His hands up on the in the. Uh, I I don't know. I've I've sent him a I sent him um, a chat. Okay, it might be. I'm not certain. Might be a misclick. <laughs> But yeah, guys, please feel, uh, please give me uh, feedback. I really am looking. I'm really looking forward to reading it. If something you don't like, by all means, tell me. Uh, don't worry about my feelings. Be as honest as possible. I'm looking to learn. And again, thanks for listening, guys. But yeah. And also, thanks all the uh, organizers for getting this event together. Rudy, you've been one of them. It's a great job, man. It's tough in these uh, COVID times. We're. Uh... We're, we're certainly having fun. <laughs>